Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with us today. My wife and I are recording this sermon message in our living room and we would like to share it with you. The title of today's message is Our Personal Reconciliation in God's Reconciliation. How do we deal effectively with our own reconciliation of our lives so that we can fully receive the reconciliation that Jesus has given to us with our Heavenly Father? Well, that's an important question for us to look at today from the Scripture. So before we begin looking at it, let's begin in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus to us so that we could be saved and not condemned and therefore be reconciled to you in relationship. Help us to be able to see the difference, though. We need to be able to be reconciled personally first so we can receive the greater reconciliation that we have with you. And so we ask and pray you'll help us to be able to receive your truth through the Spirit. And we ask and pray your blessing and inspiration of this message to be with me giving it and those hearing it that you'll be with them. In the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray and all together we say, Amen. Well, let us begin in John 3, verse uh, 16 and 17. Because first we need to believe that God our Father sent His Son Jesus to us so that we would be saved and not condemned. That is an important beginning first step. So John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. The Word became the Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And that is exactly what Jesus did. He fulfilled His Father's will. He died on the cross and forgave us of our sins so that we would not be condemned. And therefore we could be reconciled to our Father. But first we have to receive that personally. We have to feel that we are reconciled in Jesus because we are. Second, we need to stand on Jesus, our rock, to have a solid foundation. We see that talked about over in Matthew, the seventh chapter. So if you'll please turn there to Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24, Matthew 7, 24. Jesus is speaking here. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. In other words, we listen to Jesus. He's our foundation, and we're a wise person when we do that. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And in the storms of life, we need to be on the rock because otherwise we're going to find out that we can be washed away. In verse 26, but everyone who hears those words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And we can see that happening around us today, can we not? Verse 28, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. And why were they amazed? because he taught as one who had authority. He was the Word. He was the one who inspired the Bible. Yes, he spoke as though he knew what he was talking about. He had authority and not as their teachers of the law who didn't feel exactly the same way as he did. So now over in Matthew 11, if you'll turn there, we see that Jesus is the only one who can give us rest. So whenever we have a burden, we need to go with Him. Everything that burdens us, we need to go to Jesus because He is our rock and He is our rest. Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse 28. Jesus says to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And isn't that most of us, at least some of the time? It is a very wearisome and burdensome time that we live in today. And I will give you rest. Sometimes we can't even get rest at night because of all the worries that we have. And we need to take them to Jesus. In verse 29 he says, Take my yoke upon you. 
become connected to Him. Trust your life to Him. Recognize He's given us a way out of our miseries and our burdens, and He's given us His rest, His peace. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We have to learn from Jesus because He is the author and the finisher of our salvation. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He's humble and gentle, and He really is. We're always looking for someone who has humility and gentleness about them. Well, He's the one. And so we can all then learn to be like He is if we learn from Him. In verse 30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we get into His yoke, He does the pulling, the major pulling for us. And He says, See, it's easy. Come with me. I'll make the way easier for you. And He does. Because His burden is light. He doesn't put upon us things that we cannot deal with and effectively live out. He gives us His Spirit to help us live life to the full and to enjoy the life that we have, the abundant life that He's given to us. But the third point that we need to look at as far as understanding that we have received our own personal reconciliation through Jesus is that we need to walk in the Spirit to fully understand our spiritual relationship with God and God is a triune God. His nature is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's got the oneness of God, but in three persons. To know that in relationship, we have to walk in the Spirit to appreciate that. So when we believe in Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. It comes to live in our hearts. So over in Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul tells us here that we need to uh, walk in the Spirit. And we see that in Galatians, the uh, fifth chapter. And verse 13, Galatians 5, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And uh, that's the one thing that people appreciate. We want to be free, to be able to free, be free to make our own decisions in life, to, to chart our own course. And so to be free, the only way we can do it, because we can't find it under human governments, total freedom, we have to look to Jesus so that we can be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the, the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. And that is the summation of the law. As Jesus says it in John 3, 34, 13, verse 34 and 35, He said, love one another as I have loved you. So in verse 15 of Galatians 5, if if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And we can see that happening in society today. Verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Because the, the Spirit flows like a river in our lives. And if we get caught up in the Spirit, we follow the lead of the Spirit, it will lead us in the direction of God's love in every situation. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And that is the problem we have with our human nature and with God's Spirit. And the Spirit that is contrary to the flesh. See, that it goes in a different direction than our flesh would go. But it goes to a better place. They are in conflict with each other so that you are, are not to do whatever you want. We have to put down our fleshly desires to have the spiritual desires of God's love. In verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, you're not doing it because a law tells you to do it. You're doing it because you're prompted by the Spirit in your heart to do those expressions of love in your life that you have toward your family or towards God, your family, your neighbor, uh, those you work with, uh, people in your community. In verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, jealous ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, 
drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Do we get the point here? Those are the fleshly fruits. And those are the fruits that cause us harm and, and discord and unhappiness and misery. Paul continues here, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God because that's contrary to the kingdom of God. It's not expressing God's love at all. But in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Because that is the law. That's the expression of God's love. You don't have to have a law to say what it is. You just have to express it <laughs> and, and do it, live it. In verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We say no to the flesh, yes to God's Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's say yes, Lord, and keep on going forward. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other because there's plenty of God's love to go around. <laughs> we'll never be shortchanged on God's love. If we participate in it, they will come to see and appreciate we have been reconciled by Jesus Christ. He has forgiven us of our sins. He's given us of His Spirit who lives in us. We are a new creation and we are so happy to be in that relationship. So now we're in John the 17th chapter. John 17. John 17 and verse 20. Here it shows the relationship that we have now in the Spirit with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone, His original disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, which we are doing today. And if you're a believer in Jesus, you are participating as a disciple of Jesus Christ. In verse 21, that all of them may be one, see, one in the Spirit, may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So you see the spiritual relationship, you see how tight-knit it is and how one it is. Uh, as the Father and the Son are in each other, so then we would be in them too. They would be in us and we would be in them, in the oneness of the Spirit. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Now that's when we understand we have true reconciliation with ourself and then with others we encounter and deal with in life. Verse 23, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. See, man's reconciliation doesn't give us this kind of unity. Man's and woman's reconciliation does. So we may have a contradiction of terms here. What do you mean reconciled? Well, God's reconciliation is this oneness that we're seeing here in the Scripture, and it is in the Spirit of God. Then the world will know that you sent me, that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. So we receive then, in our, we're reaching out to receive it, that oneness and that expression of love from God that is the same as our Father loving Jesus. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Verse 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have seen me, or sent me, I should say. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And that is what happens when we believe in Jesus and the indwelling Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and then the Father and Jesus live in us and we live in the Father and the Son Jesus. And we are blessed. We are reconciled. We are personally reconciled to God in Christ. <clears throat> so then let's go to Matthew the fifth chapter here and see an example 
of that being led of the Spirit. Matthew, the fifth chapter and verse 23. This is the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and Jesus is speaking here. Matthew 5, 23, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and what could be more spiritual than that, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, because the Spirit is prompting your heart to know that. Verse 24, Leave your gift there in front of the altar, First, go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So that is a very spiritual act. And what are they doing here? When God tells us in our heart we need to be reconciled with someone because there's something against each other, we need to take care of it immediately. It's a thing of the Spirit. We know then that we have personally been reconciled in Christ because the Spirit is moving us to be reconciled in a situation that needs reconciliation. Because it continues here in verse 25. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is talking, taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge. That's what non-reconciliation will lead to. And the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So by reconciling, we avoid all the after effects of not reconciling. It's a spiritual act. We're following the Spirit, and we are being an agent of reconciliation. The fourth point that we need to appreciate about ourselves and our receiving reconciliation personally before we receive the larger look at reconciliation with our Father is that we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus every day. Over in uh, 2 Peter, the third chapter, let us begin in verse 10. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, and by the way, I'm reading from the NIV today, just so you know. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, by the, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and it seems like that's what's happening right now. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the, elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Yes, things are shifting, are they not? Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? A very good question for today. You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Verse 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And that's what being reconciled in Christ means to us, because sin in our life has been forgiven. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Verse 17, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. So we need to be aware of the times in which we live. Verse 18, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. That is an everyday occurrence that we need to be involved in to show ourselves that we have been reconciled in Christ. And that leads us then to our greater reconciliation. We can then participate in the greater reconciliation we have received, which is with our Father, our Heavenly Father. That's over in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. 
2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For Christ's love compels us. This is how we do anything of value, is that the Spirit and Christ's love compels us to consider these things because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore we've all died. We all participate in his death. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So we become a new creation in the Spirit. In verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We look at everybody in the world as our brother and sister in Christ, even though they may not believe in Jesus yet, because he's forgiven everybody's sin. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. So when we participate and believe in Jesus that he's forgiven our sin, then we become this new creation because we receive the Spirit into our hearts. We embrace it. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. See, it's here in us. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And that's what he did when he sent him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So this is when we can embrace the, the broader look at reconciliation, which is in our Heavenly Father. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. That's what he did on the cross. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. He's depending upon us to express it, to share it, to minister in it. In verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. He were representing his kingdom of light on earth today, and he is making his appeal through us. Ambassadors, speak up. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message for today, and we need it desperately. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God, which he's attributed to us today as believers in him. So what are our marching orders then? Well, chapter 6, verse 1. As God's co-workers then... We urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Don't just put it up on the bookshelf and say, well, that's done. Use it. Make it your own. Express it. Minister in it. For he says in verse 2, In the time of my favor I heard you. See, when we were crying out to God, Oh, God, help me. He has helped us. And in the day of salvation I helped you. He has helped us in Jesus I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. It is, because we need to wake up and stand up and speak up for the things of importance in creation and in our future, in prophecy. It all depends upon us being his ministers of reconciliation and the ambassadors of his kingdom today. Now is the day of salvation. And we are in this time, and it's critical that we do who we are, say our part, be who we are. We're reconciled in Jesus, and we want to be reconciled and participate in what God our Father has given to us to show to the world that we know why Jesus was sent. And we are here to declare it and to say what he's done. He's reconciled us all by forgiving us of our sins. We are a saved people. And we want the whole world to be saved and be reconciled. So please join with me in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you, dear God, for sending your Son Jesus to us. Thank you, Jesus, for going through with everything that was required of you to forgive us of our sins by dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. We are yours because you have bought us with a great price. And dear Lord Jesus, you want us to do what our Father is asking us to do to join with you and your ministry of reconciliation around the world. May your holy will be done. May everyone come to know you, Jesus, and why the Father sent you to us. We praise you, dear God. We thank you. Please strengthen us and bless us and protect us from the evil one. 
In your holy and righteous name, Jesus, we pray this. And all together we say, Amen. Amen.